A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Agreement sums is what we'll see. Q, R, S, T, U, V. The summation notation we will also study. Now I know my A, B, C. Next time, won't you sing with me? All right, so what we're going to see today is Riemann sums and the summation notation. So a long time ago, I argued that if you're given the velocity function of an object, the distance traveled by the object will be given by the area under the graph of the velocity function. And I also told you that one way to approximate this area, or the distance traveled, to is to replace it by a bunch of rectangles of equal width. And to get a, an exact calculation of the area or the distance traveled, what you want to do is send the width of the rectangles to be zero, or the number of rectangles to be infinite. So what we'll do in this video is study this type of sums rigorously. These are called Riemann sums mathematically. All right, so suppose I'm given a function whose graph looks like something like this. And I'm interested in calculating the area under the graph between, say, x equals to a and x equals to b for some a and b. So I'm interested in the area here between the, the curves. How can I calculate it? So first what I'll do is approximate this area by replacing it by a bunch of rectangles of equal width. So I'll start by splitting the interval between a and b here into sub-intervals of exactly the same width. Right, so this is, these are my sub-intervals and I take this width to be exactly the same and I'm gonna call it delta x. Now how many intervals do I need? Well, I want to be very general here, so I'm gonna say that I'm splitting my interval into n some intervals for any positive integer n. Now, if I take n equals to 1, that would be a very crude approximation. If I take n equals to 1,000, that would be very good. And in the end, what I want to do is let n go to infinity to get an exact calculation of the area. But for now, let's just stick with an arbitrary number of rectangles called n. All right, so now I need to draw these rectangles. So there's a choice involved here for the upper side of the rectangles. So I'm going to take what's called the right endpoint formulation, meaning that I take the height of the rectangles to be the value of the function at the right point of my intervals. Now, this will give me some approximation for the area. Note that I could have also taken a different convention. So I could take, for example, the left endpoint formulation, where I replace these, the height of the rectangles by the value of the function at the left point of the, of the intervals. That would give me a different approximation for the area. I could also take, say, the midpoint formulation where the height is now the value of the function at the midpoint of the intervals. That would also give me a different approximation. But in the end, when I send n to infinity, all of those will give me the exact same calculation for the exact area under the graph. All right, so that's good. So now let me introduce some more notations. I'm going to call the point A here x0, and then this right endpoint for the first rectangle would be x1, this would be x2, and so on, all the way to the last one, b, which will be xn. Okay, and then what I want to do is calculate the areas of uh, all these rectangles and add them up to get an approximation for the area under the curve. So first, let me calculate the area of the, say, ith rectangle, where i can stand from anything from 1 to n, the num number of rectangles. So what is this? This is width time height. So this will be equal to delta x times the height of the rectangle, which is the value of the function at the right endpoint of the interval, which is xi. All right, and then to get the approximation, I'll just add all of those up. So I'll get something that I will call rn, which will be the sum of these areas. So I'll get first delta x times f of x1 for the first rectangle, plus delta x times f of x2 for the second rectangle, and so on, all the way to xn. And this gives me a good approximation for the area under the curve. And this is a very, very important type of uh, summation has a name, it's called a Riemann sum. And we'll see that we can actually define or calculate the true area under the curve by taking a limit of Riemann sum as n goes to infinity. But before we do that, I can actually be a little more precise here. I can get a, a more explicit expression for delta x and xi. So what is delta x? 
So while delta x is the width of each, each rectangle, and I take it to be the same for each of the rectangle. So if I have n rectangles, that means that I'm dividing b minus a, which is the length of this interval, into n sub-intervals. So each will have width delta x given by b minus a over n. All right, so that's the first thing. Second thing is that I can actually get an expression for the right endpoints xi. So let's start with the first one. So what is x1? Well, x1 will be starting at a and adding one width of a rectangle. x2 would also be starting at a, but now adding two widths, so plus two times delta x. x3 would be the same, but with a three, and so on. So I end up with the statement that xi for any i between one and n will be a plus i delta x, right? So with this, I get a more explicit formulation for the Riemann sum as being, well, delta x, which I could replace by b minus a over n, but I'll leave it as delta x times f of x1, which is a plus delta x plus uh, delta x f of a plus 2 delta x plus blah, 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 all the way to n, so f of a plus n delta x, and all of this will delta x being equal to b minus a over n. So that gives me a completely explicit expression for the Riemann sum in terms of a and b, the two endpoints of the area, and delta x, which is b minus a over n, so n, which is the number of rectangles that I'm using. All right, so this is all cool. That gives me a good approximation of the area, and, and clearly the more rectangles I have, the better the approximation will be. So to show you exactly what's going on, let me uh, show you a little app, which comes from Wolfram, which is pretty cool. So here's a function that looks like the one I had, and then suppose I want to calculate the area between x equals 2 and x equals 8. Well, let's first do it taking, so right here means that I'm taking the right endpoint formulation, so my rectangles have height given by f, the function at the right endpoint, and then I'll take only two rectangles. All right, so you see what happens. The estimated area is 279, while the actual area is 180, so that's not a very good approximation. But now if I take, say, five rectangles, well, clearly from the graph it is better. And in fact, I get 217, which is differently closer than 180. But if I take, say, 100 rectangles, well, that takes a little while. But now you see how great the approximation is. And in fact, I get 181 instead of 180. So that's very, very close. And in all these cases, you can see here that uh, my approximation is always going to be an overestimate of the actual area. And you can see why from the graph. The reason is that because I'm taking the right endpoint rule and the function is increasing, then my rectangles are always a little higher than the function. So I'm actually really overestimating the value uh, of the area. But if I take, for example, the left endpoint formulation, so you'll see what happens if I do that. So now the rectangles are all below because I'm taking the, the height of the rectangles to be the value of the function at the left endpoint. And indeed, my estimated area now is an underestimate it's less than the actual area, but if I take many, many of those, 1,000, say, uh, then I will get a very, very good approximation of the area. All right, that takes a while to calculate 1,000, but you see what happens. I get 179.82, which is very close to 180. All right, so this is all very cool, but that only gives me an approximation of the area. To get the true area under the graph, what I want to do is send the number of rectangles to be infinity. So, in fact, I can take that as a definition, if you want, of the area under the graph. So, I'll call that A. So, I'll calculate the area under the graph by taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the Riemann sum Rn. And that will give me an exact calculation of the area under the graph. And, in fact, you can prove that if you do that, then it does not matter whether you use, whether you use the right endpoint rule or the left endpoint rule or any of these rules they will all give you the exact same answer when you take the limit where the number of rectangles go to infinity. Okay, so this is cool. So we're, in class, what we're going to do is, is study how to calculate such uh, limits, so limits of Riemann sums, very explicitly. But what I want to do uh, now in this video is introduce some notation, because carrying on this kind of whole summation is pretty annoying. So we're going to introduce a fantastic and very, very useful notation for this type of summation, which is the following. So I'm going to introduce the notation that the sum here will be given by a big sigma, so this is a capital sigma letter, a Greek letter, 
What this means is that I'm going to be summing between i equals 1 to n the expression delta x f of a plus i delta x. So what that means is that I'm summing this expression uh, running with the index i running from 1 to n. So this is a much shorter notation for denoting this finite sum here. So what I want to do in the, uh, the remaining part of this video is study this notation further because many, I know many of you are not familiar with this notation. So I'll give you some properties of this summation notation and there's a few sums that we need to know to be able to evaluate a simple Riemann sum. So I'll tell you all about that in the second part of this video. All right, summation notation. What does that mean? So when I write something like that, capital sigma letter for some index i running from say k to n of some object which has an index i, what I mean is that I'm summing uh, over a i with i running from k to n. So I'll start with a to the k plus a to the k plus 1 plus and so on all the way to a to the n minus 1 plus a to the n. This is what this notation means. Now there's two things here that I assume when I write this. First I assume that k and n are integers otherwise this notation doesn't make sense. And I'm also going to assume that n is greater or equal to k so that I'm, I can count from k to n to make sense of this notation. All right, so let me give you two examples here just to clarify what I mean. So if I write, for example, the sum from, say, i equals to 3 to 6 of i, what do I mean? I mean that I'm going to sum the object i with i running from 3 to 6. So I get 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. This is exactly what this notation stands for. It stands for this finite sum here. Another example, suppose that I take the summation from i equals 4 to 5, say, of, I don't know, 5i square. So again, I'm taking this term and then adding up the value of this term for i running from 4 to 5. So in this case, there's only, only going to be two terms in the summation. So I get first 5 times 4 square plus 5 times 5 square. So summations satisfy a whole bunch of properties. So I, I'm going to present a few here. I'm not going to prove them, but if you are interested in the proofs, uh, you can look at Appendix D in the textbook where the summation notation is explored in more detail. But the first one is straightforward. So it's saying that if you have a summation of a whole bunch of terms that have a common factor of C, then you can just factor out the C, and the, 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 the summation here becomes C times the summation of the AI. And that's clear because every term will be of the form c times a i. So I can just factor out the c and then I get c times a1 plus a2 all the way to a n. Second thing is also, second property is also straightforward. So if I have the sum of a i plus or minus b i, it's the same thing as the sum of a i plus or minus the sum of b i because I'm, all I'm doing here is, is, is uh, taking the summation and just rearranging the terms to get uh, the sum of the two summations. And I can also split a summation. So if I'm summing ci from i running from n to n, for any k between n to m, m and n, I can rewrite that as a sum from m to k first, and then from k plus 1 to n. All right, so these are standard properties of sums, and they're very useful when we have to manipulate uh, summations. And there's a number of finite sums here that uh, will be very useful when we try to evaluate Riemann sums explicitly in class. So let me present them. In this video. So the first one is the summation from i equals 1 to n of the number 1. What does that mean? Well that means that I'm summing 1 for i running from 1 to n. So I'll get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus blah 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 plus 1 and the whole thing n times. So 1 appears n times here. So what is 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times? Well this is just n. Right, so whenever I see the summation, I can replace it by n. All right, the second one is not as obvious. So here I'm summing from i equals 1 to n the uh, object i, the expression i. So here I'm summing i for i running from 1 to n, so I get 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus blah, 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 all the way to n. And it turns out that there's a very nice expression for such a finite sum, and you can prove that this is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. 
Now the proof is non-trivial. There's two different ways of proving it. You can look at Appendix D if you are interested, but it's a good exercise to try it yourself. You could use the binomial theorem, or you can prove it by induction, like we've seen before in this class. All right, there's two other ones that will be useful. So the third one is the sum from i running from 1 to n of i square. So this is going to be 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square all the way to n square. And it turns out that this also has a nice expression. It's equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. And the whole thing is divided by 6. This is not so obvious to prove, but it is true. And the last one is the sum, again, from i running from 1 to n of i cube. So this is 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube all the way to n cube. And it turns out that this is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2, whole thing square. It's actually quite interesting to remark that this is just the square of this. right? So the summation of the cubes here is, gives you the square of the summation of, uh, from 1 to n, which is not obvious at all. If you think about it, that's not so obvious. All right, so let me end this video by giving you an example of how you can use these summations and the properties of summations that we saw in the previous slide to evaluate the type of finite sums that we will see when we calculate Riemann sums. So we'll have sums like the following, summation from i equals 1 to n of something like 5 times i over n cubed, say. How can I evaluate that? Well, let me first rewrite that slightly. So I'm going to rewrite this as 5 over n cubed times i cubed. And then you can remark that 5 over n cubed is actually a constant, right? I'm summing over i, so n is completely independent of i, so this whole thing is a constant. So by the first property of summations, I can pull the constant out because every term here will share the same constant. So I can rewrite that as 5 over n cubed summation from i equals 1 to n of i cubed. And then I have this expression here, which is exactly the same as this. So I can use the formula that I have here to simplify or to evaluate the finite sum. I end up with the result that I get 5 over n cubed times n times n plus 1 over 2, all things square. And that gives me an explicit expression uh, for the summation here. So this is the type of calculation that we'll have to do when we calculate Riemann sums explicitly in class.